Okay, we're in the book of Colossians, and we're beginning chapter 3. The epistle has four chapters. We've completed two, and we have two to go. Now, when we started the book, we said that the first two chapters were doctrinal. That is to say, they tell you the things that you ought to know. The last two chapters are practical. That is to say, they tell you what the results or the outworking of that knowledge should be. What should be the manifestation of the knowledge in your own life? What does it do to you? What does it bring about? Because you learned what was taught in the first two chapters. And you can tell by the phraseology in the very first verse of chapter 3 that the verse there, the language in the verse, is tying you to something that has been said previously. But if you were to take these four verses, these first four verses in Colossians chapter 3 by themselves, they really don't make much rational sense, especially if you were to go and read them to someone who might be quite erudite as far as the world's standards are concerned, but who had uh, no spiritual background. They, they would sound rather foolish. It, it just wouldn't make sense. Now, let's read the, these uh, four verses, and let's suppose you had no spiritual insight whatsoever, and uh, uh, someone is just reading this to you. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our, our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What do you suppose uh, the, uh, the apostle is saying here? What is this outworking, or what is this um, manifestation uh, that he's describing here? Well, notice uh, we have the phrase with Christ in each of the three verses. In verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, and then in verse 3, for ye are dead and your life is hidden with Christ, and then in verse 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him, with Christ, with Christ, with him. Uh, and the him there also, of course, is Christ. Well, the first with Christ has something to do with uh, God's reckoning concerning your past. It's something that's already happened according to God's viewpoint. The second with Christ is something that is going on now in the present tense, from God's viewpoint. And the third with him is something that is to take place in the future from God's viewpoint. So we have uh, three tenses of our union with Christ. The Bible teaches that we're one with Jesus Christ in some mysterious way. Now remember we found the word mystery in the doctrinal part, and we learned just what a, a mystery was. Uh, for instance, in chapter 1, verse 27, we found, uh, well, first in uh, verse 26 of chapter 1, even the mystery which hath been hidden from ages and from generations. And then in verse 27, to, him, uh, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you Gentiles. And then in chapter 2, verse 2, the last phrase, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Jesus Christ. We found out that a mystery in the Bible is something that's hidden to some and made known to others. Now, this could be a time element. In other words, it could be something that's hidden to everybody and then at some particular time is made known. Or it could be something that is hidden to a certain group and made known to the others. For instance, in the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew, we have a series of parables. And each parable uh, uh, says that it is telling you something about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. 
that uh, there's something there that's hidden. As a matter of fact, uh, in that uh, portion of scriptures, the apostles came to Christ and said, why do you speak to these people in, miracle, in, in parables? There were people gathered all around. And uh, they said, why, do you, why are you speaking to these people in parables? And Jesus Christ answered their question. Now, you can find this in uh, Matthew chapter 13. He says, because these things are hidden. He says, because uh, they are not to be known by those who are without. Uh, but he says, to you, that is, you who follow me, they're to be, be known. In other words, much that's told in the Bible is told by God in such a way that the natural mind just cannot grasp it. And God does it this way on purpose because he wants to, by his own power and wisdom, unfold it or open it up to the minds of those who are pleased to glorify him in their lives here. So this uh, book of Colossians has much to say about the mysteries. And one of the mysteries in this book is the matter that God considers that your own life is now hidden with Christ at another geographical location, somewhere else than on this earth. Now maybe if we, if we take, uh, take it in that sense, then we can unravel this. If ye then be risen with Christ. Now the supposition here is that you already understand, that you've already been taught, that you've already assimilated into your understanding the fact that you've already been raised from the dead. Because God counts that operation to have happened to you already. As a matter of fact, when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross. God faced out into the future and he saw everyone who would ever receive Jesus as their savior. And he, in his own mind's eye, reached out and took that one and placed them on the cross with Christ so that everyone that would be his was dying in Christ, was one with Christ in the death of Christ. And then, as Christ went into the grave, and as he rose triumphant from the grave, he saw each of those also as having risen with Christ. His mind's eye uh, looked out into the future and counted each one that would ever receive Christ as having had a part in the death of Christ on the cross and a part with the victorious resurrection of Christ from the dead. Past tense. Now, this became operative as far as you and God are concerned in your relationship together at the time you received Christ as your Savior. See, in God's uh, way of thinking, he doesn't place things chronologically. Uh, you might say, and we can't quite grasp this, he sees everything in the present tense. And al although this didn't take uh, an additional thought on his part, when you actually received Christ. It brought you into the situation. When you actually placed your trust in the death of Christ, when you uh, counted on, when, when you with your mind counted on the fact that your sins were fully paid for in that sacrifice on Calvary, Calvary's cross, when you accepted that for yourself, then at that time, you got in on the secret, you see. You didn't understand it yet and you didn't comprehend it. God's got to have doctrinal portions of the Bible to get the comprehension across to you. But that's when you began to participate in it. See, God had it all in his mind before you were ever born. But you were brought into uh, his, uh, the operation of that glorious mystery at the time you received Christ as your Savior. And there in that instance, he, back there when that happened with you, he placed you on the cross with Christ, and he let you rise from the dead with Christ. Now, this truth is told many times in the scriptures. It's told in the greatest amount of detail in Romans chapter 6. So we might just go read that briefly again. We've done this several times before, but uh, uh, here again, we need to understand just how God is looking upon our present status. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, please take water baptism out of your mind here. He's not talking about some time when you may or may not have been dipped under the water and brought up again. Although uh, baptism, uh, however, uh, would signify an understanding of, of the truth that's taught here. We're not speaking here of a historical time when you uh, had some rite performed. Now, all that has its place, but that's not what God is talking about here. He saying, Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, or that is, placed into his death, or, as we said earlier, identified with his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And here again, not by water baptism. You were not buried with him by baptism into death at the time you subjected yourself uh, uh, again to the rites. This happened to you experientially when you received Christ as your Savior. That's when it happened. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death for a purpose. What is that purpose? That as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is or has been already crucified with him, and that the body of, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, now watch this, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, this is the uh, expansion of this thought. And if you didn't quite catch it, uh, go back and let the Holy Spirit uh, teach you again. But uh, you'll see, if you read this carefully, that God counts you to have died with Christ on the cross and to have been raised from the dead when Christ was raised from the dead. Now, Paul's comprehension of this, as far as he is personally concerned, shows through very clearly in that scripture in Galatians 2.20, remember? He says, I am, I have been already, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. That is to say, I am not dead like a doornail although I've been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the, and the life that I now live, this walk that I walk, this day-to-day uh, uh, -day operation that I carry on, is lived by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can you see, in Galatians uh, 2.20, can you see Paul appropriating this doctrinal truth and expounding it in his own life? Now, we had this, remember, last week in Colossians chapter 2, and, of course, this is uh, the truth to which our scripture here is referring. We had the doctrinal truth pre uh, presented to us in Colossians 2.12 buried with him in baptism, in which also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, that was the doctrinal presentation. Here is the, out, the outworking, the practicality of that, what you should be doing about it, uh, what uh, this should bring about in your own life. Again, Colossians 3, 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, and God counts you to have already been, if that's true, then seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting currently on the right hand of God. Remember when he was teaching, uh, we have this recorded in the Sermon on the Mount, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. 
Now, Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. This is a truth that's proclaimed over and over in the New Testament. You read the ends of the gospel chapters, like, oh, the last two verses in, in the gospel of Mark, for instance, and it'll tell you that when Christ rose from the dead, he sat down at the right hand of God. We had this in Ephesians, the first chapter, and then it's proclaimed again and again in the book of Hebrews four times. Once in the first chapter, once in the eighth chapter, once in the tenth chapter, and once in the twelfth chapter, that Christ is now sat down. It was proclaimed prophetically in the 110th Psalm, where uh, the proclamation is that God the Father said that God the Son, sit thou on my right hand. And then that uh, Psalm, that prophetic uh, uh, pronouncement, is uh, brought out and explained again and again in the New Testament scriptures. That is what Jesus is doing now. He is sat down at the right hand of God and he's administering the affairs of the church, of the whole world, in a uh, capacity of vetoing those things which the world would do and which would interfere with his program. God right now has given a fairly free reign to man. Now, Satan has usurped much of that, and God... Uh, channels it where man's operations would otherwise upset his purposes. He hasn't just abandoned the earth. Someone keeps asking me, what are we going to learn next and what book are we going to teach? Well, we're going to try the book of Ezekiel. Uh, that depends upon how much you pray between now and then because I've never taught the book of Ezekiel and there's much in it I don't understand. But I do understand this, that the people at that time gave an excuse for the way they were. And their excuse was that God had abandoned man. He'd abandoned this earth. Uh, he, he had just uh, turned his back on the whole world and gone about his way. They took uh, uh, sight of the evil and, and injustice and so forth in the world, and they concluded that God was not operating in the world at all. Well, the world seems to pretty much take that for granted now, but that isn't so. God has not abandoned the world. But he's given over to man free reign to an extent. So, God is doing something in the world, and he's only doing it through Jesus Christ, who is sat down at his right hand. He's, uh, and so Jesus Christ is carrying on an operation in the world. He's directing uh, an operation in the world from the vantage point of the right hand of God. And if you want to be, from a practical standpoint, part of that operation, then you have to know what's been taught in the first two chapters of this book, and you have to let it affect you in the manner described here in the third chapter. So here we go again. If ye then be risen with Christ... See, that's past tense, isn't it? It happened in the past tense, in God's, from God's point of view. If that has happened... Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on this earth. Now, there's a very favorite saying among people, many of them well-intentioned. There's a favorite saying concerning other people whom are thought to be somewhat too pious. And the saying is something like this. He is so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Well, the Bible teaches it a different way. The Bible teaches you it's only to the extent that you're heavenly minded that you are any earthly good from a lasting standpoint. I'll, I'll put it another way. Let's suppose that you have all of your mind and intent and all of your compassion, all of your emotions bent towards uh, an orphanage, uh, we'll say, uh, over in uh, uh, Bangladesh. That's, that's a good place to have an orphanage, isn't it? Uh, and uh, you're, you're all tied up in your compassion for those little uh, motherless and fatherless children. And so you decide to dedicate your 
entire life to relieve their suffering. So you're earthly good. And uh, you don't uh, you don't worry about giving to any missionary effort, and you don't worry about uh, being involved in soul winning, because you're concerned about earthly problems, and you say, well, if I concern myself enough with the earthly problems of those little children, God will look out after my future, and I won't have to be concerned with that. Well, you see, that is manufacturing for yourself a God to your choosing. Because that's not what the Bible says. As a matter of fact, now I've lost many friends on this uh, little pronouncement that's going to come out, and uh, you probably will misunderstand me, and you probably won't come back to the Bible study anymore. Because I'm going to say a most horrible thing. What you may be doing by being so involved is just raising up little children to be fodder for hell when they could have died and gone to heaven. You see, if nobody proclaims the gospel to these little children you're so concerned about, if nobody tells them that Jesus loves them and died for them, they'll grow up in their sins and go to hell. And if you'd have let them die when they were a year and a half old of starvation, they wouldn't have grown up and heaped to themselves condemnation. Now, we don't comprehend that kind of talk. And we don't say it very much because it doesn't register uh, right on, uh, on the human mind. It, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't get through in the right way. So you see, what God wants is for us to be heavenly minded. And listen, never you mind. Your God has a deep compassion for the physical welfare of his creatures. And when you get heavenly minded enough, you will have a compassion for hungry people. And it'll be God-directed. And it'll be in the right perspective. And God will channel it to his purposes because the compassion will have come from God and not from yourself. So set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now here's our next with Christ, and it's about the present. Right now, tonight, where is your life? Well, if you understand uh, the doctrine here, the teaching, and if you've appropriated for yourself, your life is not here in this room. Your life is hidden. It's with Christ at the right hand of God. Now, there's a life in your body here, but it's a life that's an, the outworking and the motivation of Christ. See, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And Jesus Christ, if your life is hid there, Jesus Christ, Christ marched your body to this place or whatever place you were last night for that matter or this morning. He did that. Christ liveth in me, Paul said. Now you say, hmm, that's a little, little hard to comprehend and appropriate. Yes, that's because self dies hard. And it has to be put to death repeatedly, as we'll see. Paul says, I die daily takes a daily death. Why is that? Well, you see, if this worked for perfection, and if I have truly appropriated this, then my wife has Jesus for a husband, and my children have Jesus for a father, and you have Jesus for a Bible teacher. And you know that's not so, and I'll assure you my wife uh, <laughs> could uh, inform you about the other matter. But if this outworking is to the extent that it ought to be. Now, shame on me if, Je if, if my wife doesn't ever have Jesus for a husband. And shame on me if my children don't ever have Jesus for a father. And they do, to the extent that I understand and appropriate this doctrine. 
to the extent that I die momentarily to self. Now, this is a rather glorious thing, that your own aspirations, your own life, is hidden somewhere now, temporarily, that God might have an outworking or a manifestation in your body here. Now, I found this to the extent that I've appropriated this, that Jesus wants some of the things that I find to be most pleasant. That is to say, he wants my wife to have a husband. And he's pleased to use this earthly frame so that he can accomplish that. And he wants my children to have a father. And he wants some people, evidently, to have instruction in the Word. And these are all things that fit into my aspirations. That's what I want. I want my wife to have a husband. And I want my children to have a father. You see, so I find out, sometimes to my utter amazement, that what I really want is so much better than what I thought I wanted. And that's probably the hardest thing for me to learn. And I find out that so many times. That that which I really want is so much more enjoyable than that which I thought I wanted. Now you say, well, he really is getting up into the clouds here. <laughs> but um, I don't want to bring it completely down to earth. Let's talk about this matter of your life. God does not want you to become a non-entity. That's not what he means when he says he wants to count you as being dead. Neither does he want your personality to be merged in one great big stew pot full of personality, and you're just a, your personality is all intermingled with, with everybody else that gets saved. No. He wants to bring out your own individuality to its very sharpest degree. He never made anybody else like you. That's the reason you're so very, very precious to him. If you go to hell, he won't have anybody like you with which to fellowship with all the eternal ages, and that's why it's such a terrible sin for you to reject God's provision and go to hell. That's the greatest tragedy, is that God is robbed of the fellowship of that particular individual that he wanted for himself, and that he purchased at such great price. So he has much purpose for your individuality. Now what's happened, our old sinful nature, and we're going to learn more about that in a few minutes, aided by Satan, has so perverted our personality that sometimes our very best friends don't think we're very lovable and that we're really not very valuable. But that's, you see, uh, because the life that God wants forever, the individuality that he wants, has been obscured by something else that's, that's marred and covered up. But he has a life for you. It's an eternal outworking of the real you. And he just wants that to be hidden for a while. He wants you to enjoy it only in anticipation. And he gives you little glimpses throughout the scriptures. But your real life is hidden now. That's his purpose in Christ. Currently, see, that's the present aspect. For ye are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. But not forever. It's not hidden forever. When Christ, who is our life now, shall appear, at that time shall all of us, all of you, also appear with him in glory or in glorification. Now, the word glory means excellence on display. You may think that you have no excellence to be displayed. 
But that's only because God is not through with you yet. You uh, hear the, see the fellow with a little motto on him? Please be patient with me, God is not through yet. <laughs> God, God is not through with you yet. And uh, when he's through with you, when he's got you all fixed up, you'll be something worth displaying in great excellence. As a matter of fact, we're going to see, time doesn't slip by too fast, a verse which is going to give you just a little insight on that. So, in summary, God counts you to have died with Christ. He counts you to have already conquered death. He counts you to be on the other side of death. And to have a life of your very, very own, very, very individualistic, the outworking of which life is not yet made manifest, held in abeyance. This is a mystery. Then he wants to have an outworking here. Now, he doesn't want Randy to just be a cold, dead something to lay in the grave right now because he wants Kathy to have a husband and Amy to have a father. See? But that's Christ's desire. And it's only should be Randy's desire in, to the extent that he's one with Christ. Just because he wants the same thing Jesus wants. So, you see, it, it fits together real nicely, even for here, doesn't it? While we're dead. And our life is hid. And since we're one with Christ, we get in on the enjoyments of it. And we get to be uh, onlookers, participators in what he's doing in the world today. And as we said, he's doing things here in the world today. Now, all of this that we're saying, of course, is true only from the time you relinquish your own rights, according to our thinking, your own rights on your own life, and you surrender them to him. You've never done that. Well, this doesn't apply to you. It's certainly not in the past tense. Now, how do you go about appropriating this? Verse 5, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Mortify means put to death. And remember the scripture, it's in Luke chapter 9, among other places, when Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, or if anyone would follow me, if anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And he goes on to say in the next verse, whosoever shall lose his life shall find it, and whosoever shall find his life shall lose it. That's a paradox, isn't it? Why did he say, die daily? First, he didn't say take up his cross in that verse. There is an aspect in which you can take up the cross of Christ. That's not what he's saying there. He said that before he ever went to a cross. He said, take up your cross daily and follow him. What is your cross? Well, it's that on which you're executed. See, when someone was consigned to crucifixion, they were made to carry the crossbar of their own cross. That was part of the humility. That was what the people watched. They were made to carry the great crossbar of the cross. Uh, the, uh, the pole had already been put in the ground. <coughs> and uh, uh, wherever the execution was to take place. And the crossbar was laid on the shoulders of the one to be crucified. He was made to carry the crossbar to his own cross. So when you take up your cross, you're marching to your execution. That's what it means. And it says you've got to do this daily. Well, you say, well, that's not very pleasant. Except if you have the same outlook 
as Jesus did in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, he says, For the joy that was set before him he endured, the shame and the suffering, even the death on the cross. He endured it because he didn't have his mind on being strung up on the cross. He looked at that which was the other side in anticipation in this place, the peace and comfort and joy. So it's not a burdensome thing to take up your cross daily because he gives you a, a future joyous expectation and you keep your eye on that. So you gladly pick up your cross daily. It's a joy to do so. Now, if it's not a joy, you're not doing it right. If it's a burden, then you didn't get the idea. What does it mean to mortify your members? Well, the manifestation that your members are not mortified is that they will practice some of these, not everyone overtly, obviously, but they will practice fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, is concupiscence, is uh, intense desire, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Several places in the Bible, covetousness is called idolatry. For instance, in Ephesians 5.5, 5, it's called that. Why? Well, covetousness is, I want something. I have my mind centered on something I desire, and that's what I'm going to strive for. That's what I desire. Well, you see, what we're supposed to desire is the fullness of Christ in our life. And so anytime we are centering our affections on something other than Christ, we're committing idolatry because we're letting some other love take the place of our love for God. And that's why covetousness is idolatry. Verse 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. You may have heard it said that the Old Testament displays a God of wrath, and the New Testament displays a God of love. Well, if you heard somebody say that, he didn't get it from the Bible. For the New Testament gives a greater revelation than the Old Testament, a clearer revelation than the Old Testament of both the wrath of God and the love of God. It brings both of those characteristics into greater focus and portrays them with greater intensity. And if you don't understand that and uh, you haven't learned that, you can come into a complete comprehension by a little operation, very simple. Get a concordance. Look up the word wrath and see how many times it's used concerning God in the New Testament, in each verse. And you'll have considerable reading to do. And when it's finished, you'll understand the wrath of God. Much better, at least. No, it is not true that the Old Testament portrays a God of wrath and that the New Testament portrays, <coughs> portrays a God of love. The wrath of God is brought into the sharpest focus in the book of Revelation, where the term is used quite frequently, which you can see by simply consulting a concordance. It's not on the wrath of God tonight, but I just wanted to be sure that, uh, that you didn't miss that. Verse 7, In the which ye also walked some time, or once walked, when ye lived in them. Now, in verse 8, He's going to give you some other things which show the uh, outworking of your members that have not been mortified. And he says, before you surrendered to Christ, you wore these like a garment. 
You know, other people behold your clothes with a much greater view than you do. The fact is, you just see them from an angle. And everybody you come upon sees your clothing in full view. But it's the same way with what we do with the members of our body. The other people see it a lot better than we do. We tend to uh, fairly well ignore it. We're looking off somewhere else. But those with whom we come in contact are looking at our clothing in full force. And that's why we have these terms put off and put on. Notice in verse 8, put off. Verse 9, put off. Verse 10, put on. Verse 12, put on. This terminology is used quite frequently in the New Testament. For instance, you'll find it in uh, Romans, except there when it says put off, it says cast off. In other words, take the clothing and cast it aside. Romans chapter 13, I believe it is, and then in the book of Ephesians, and you'll find it uh, explained in uh, Revelation chapter 3, where the church of Laodicea is said to be naked and they need to put on the clothing of righteousness. See, evil is described in the Bible in two ways, both as filthy rags. Actually, filthy rags is not so much what we would call evil, but it's trying to cover up our nakedness with our own good works. Our own good works are called filthy rags. God's righteousness, to be clothed with his righteousness, is to be clothed with shining white apparel. So it says in verse 8, But now ye also put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man and his deeds. This is part of mortifying. This is how you can tell how effective you've been in shedding out, or shedding off the old man. How are you clothed? And have put on the new man that is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in and all. In other words, that puts us all on the same level. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now this phrase here, bowels of mercy, just means uh, mercies that come from your innermost being. In the King James Version, the word bowels simply means your innermost being. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. And we go on and on as to the outworking. And we get quite precise here as we go along. We won't be able to do all of this now. But if you want to know uh, to the, the extent to which you've been able to die daily and to put on your new garment, just measure yourself by these. Because if Jesus is living his life in your being, then he has put on tender mercies. And he is showing uh, the outworking, he's showing his kindness and his humbleness of mind, and his meekness, and his long-suffering. He's forbearing. He's not quarreling. And he's showing a subtle peace. And whatsoever he's doing in your body, he's doing it to the glory of God. In the name
name of the Lord Jesus, and he's giving thanks to God the Father. So you see, you can tell what clothes you're wearing by which of these categories you fit in and to the extent. So you see, to be heavenly minded is to be earthly good. Who would say that these outworkings that we've had here, beginning with verse 12 and on through verse 17, are of no earthly good? That's what this old world needs, all of that. How do you get that by being heavenly minded? Set your affections on things above. Let your life be hidden Christ and surrender to him. See, the psalmist says in, in Psalm 39, verse 5, now this is pretty bad, but it's what it says. It says, every man in his very best state, not his worst state, not when he's doing average, but every man in his very best state is altogether vanity. Now, that doesn't give us very much credit. That's Psalm 39.5, if you want to look it up. Jeremiah cried out, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself, but it is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Now you're going to ask me where that is. I think it's Jeremiah 10.23. Maybe somebody will look it up and correct me. We just don't have the capacity. But if we yield ourselves over to Christ, let him live his life through us, then our walk will be right because he knows how to walk. Somebody find that scripture? 10.23. Is that it? Okay. Jeremiah 10.23. Now let's uh, just say a few words about this new clothing, how we look when we put on this new clothing. Uh, see if you think this, this looks all right. Let's turn first to uh, 2 Corinthians. Three eighteen. But we all, with open or unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, this word changed in verse 18 is the same word as the word that you find in, in that scene upon the Mount of Transfiguration, where it says, the body of Christ was transfigured, transformed. And if you read that account, it's in the 17th chapter of Matthew. It's in the 9th chapter of Luke, and I believe the ninth chapter of, of Mark. And if you were to look that account up in all three of those scriptures, you would get the idea that the writer was rather hard-pressed to describe what Jesus really looked like. It says, white, so white and bright and shiny that no cleanser on earth could make it any whiter. The idea was that he was glistening and brilliant. And that's the same idea you have over in the 19th chapter of Revelation when Jesus is going to unhide your life. When that uh, future part there that we read in uh, Colossians 3 is going to take place. When your life shall appear with him in glorification. See, we have in Revelation chapter 19 a future scene which in, involves Jesus Christ with his own. Let's start reading it, Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now, this word white is not the ordinary word for white, just the color white, or the lack of color, as the case may be. That's not the word that we have here. We have, uh, the word means 
dazzlingly white with great brilliance, bright. The same word that, that the translator is trying to translate back over in the transfiguration scene to describe Jesus in his transfiguration. And as I say, if you read all three accounts, it would be quite evident to you that he's having some problem putting the picture into language. Uh, 198 again. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the, here's a strange word, the righteousnesses, this word really is, or the righteous acts of the saints, the clothing that they wore that we read about in, Col in Colossians chapter 3. And he saith unto me, Right, and blessed are they who are called unto the marriage of the supper lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, when you are presented in this way, because the bride there is the word collectively used, individual saints of God, when they come back with him. And uh, this is uh, the portion of scriptures, of course, that inspired uh, the Hallelujah Chorus, King of Kings. Lord of Lords, because all of the hosts, all of God's hosts, will not be able to keep their excitement contained, and they'll burst out into those everlasting songs. A brilliance. And what we're being told here in the practical part of this book, that in God's sight, you can be just that dazzling in all of its brilliance here by your righteousnesses, that clothing that we read about, forbearance of one another, and uh, gentleness, and meekness, and humbleness of mind. And this is the glory here of uh, dying daily, counting yourself dead every day, alive and available for that outworking which Christ would have in your life so that he might be manifested on this earth. And I suppose that's why in the book of Romans, the 13th chapter, when this put on and put off the clothing is concerned, it concludes with, put ye on therefore the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on like a garment so that the manifestation might be the same as his manifestation. I think that's Romans 13, 14. Maybe I should have looked it up. So you say, well, when can I expect to appropriate this for myself? Well, when the apostle had lived, the apostle Paul had used, lived a fruitful life, he says, not that I had already attained, but I press forward to the mark of the high calling. You see, there's no way here that to our fellow human being the garment can be so dazzling as the garment of Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Nor there's no way here that your garment can be so dazzling as it's going to be in the manifestation in the future. That is, there's no way it can be that dazzling in the eyes of your fellow human being because he's trained to center in on your shortcomings that makes him look better. Uh, this is one of the way we salve our own consciousness by, uh, by at least unconsciously or uh, inwardly seeking to ferret out the imperfections of others. We stack our own selves up against their imperfections and this helps us a little bit in our own eyes. So we're not very much attuned to behold the dazzle. But God will see you that way right here now because that's what he's looking for. He doesn't have to measure himself against anything. So he's not looking for the worst points. He has his eye glued to every little time that that 
gentleness and humbleness of Christ shows through in your daily walk. And oh, how it gladdens your heart, his heart, yours too. Just a little glimpse of Jesus in you. That's what he's looking for now, here and now. And he beholds that righteousness of Christ shining through, and he closes his eyes. As far as his beholding is concerned, he closes his eyes to the imperfections that we seem to seek out and notice. So let's not worry about whether we dazzle the eyes of our fellow human beings or whether we don't. God is watching in a very loving way. He's not condemning. He's watching. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that somehow we have our minds turned towards wanting to be clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would want to put him on as clothing, and we'd want to cast off all of these manifestations of the fleshly desires of our body. God, teach us the truths of such scriptures as we've had before us this evening. God, help us to set aside just a little time each 24 hours that we might think upon these things and that we might understand the great mysteries of our God. In Jesus' name, amen.